Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to my Music Monday. Today, I made you a, a cute little checklist here. Check that out. I had a commission with the United States Air Force, and my commander, his name was Lowell E. Graham. He believed in checklists, and if you know anything about the Air Force, you can't do anything without a checklist. So, <clears throat> I have a checklist here of what we're going to talk about today. Today's Music Monday is called Step by Step. I'm going to take you through a piece of music I did for Extreme Music. I was very uh, fortunate to be invited to participate in their Epic Christmas 2 album. So uh, I was lucky enough to have three tracks on that album. And the particular one we're going to go over today is called Wild Spruce Chase. And let me tell you how I approach uh, just straight on composing. If I'm not, uh, if there's not, if it's not to a movie or a TV show or a commercial. And we know that the overall, overall concept of, is Christmas. So in this particular one, I figured out you know, what's the purpose and what's the imagery. And what I came up with, I had visions of a really classy lady, uh, kind of like in the 60s, kind of like a breakfast at Tiffany's thing. Some woman dressed in black with pearls and a, and a hat and frantically driving around Manhattan, New York, all going to all the classy department stores and uh, doing her Christmas shopping, like in a mad rush. So uh, that's where I started out. And it's very important when you're writing music to understand. Let me put this up here. And by the way, we are in my very humble uh, studio here. I do, this is, this is, let me give you a panoramic view of my studio. Uh, well, I should say my writings, my composing space, which is, this is it. You're in it. Um, for all of you tech heads, I'll geek out for a second. I do a large percentage of my work in the box. I don't uh, <clears throat> normally go to a studio to do all my pre-production and things like that. I do it all here. And uh, this particular project was recorded uh, with an orchestra. And I did all the pre-production here and I did all the post-production uh, here as well, and I didn't use any outboard gear or anything like that. I use all in the box, and if you want to completely geek out, I'd be happy to geek out for you. I'm going to take pull up a track here, go to my tracks window, where you can see the screen. This is why I don't go to the studio, because I have my share of audio plugins and uh, it's still going, and instrument plugins. So I could do a lot of the pre production here, and the knowledge that I got to do, how, do production and pre production was earned bit by bit and made by making lots and lots of mistakes. And I still make mistakes from time to time, but for most of the time, I hit everything on the money that I'm satisfied and uh, the people that I create music are satisfied. That's why I do everything in the box. I used to have lots of equipment, lots of gear, lots of cables going around, and I, I frankly got kind of sick and tired of it. It's fun to do every once in a while. I will take my mixes over to uh, a studio and do a final polish on them, you know, put it through some uh, wonderful uh, uh, audio console to get a really rich sound. But most of the work is done here. All the homework and all the heavy lifting is done here at home. So let's go back to the composing process because all the, you can learn all the technical aspects. If you don't have great music or, you know, I'm not saying that my music is the greatest, but if you don't have a clear musical um, idea to express, you, you, all the equipment in the world isn't going to is, isn't going to help you. And if I'm not saying hi to everyone, hi Bryson uh, and everyone else that's joined, if I'm not saying hi to you, I'm just trying to, I don't want to make this thing an hour and a half long. I'm trying to get, get it down to be under a half an hour. And if you miss anything, you can capture it on my YouTube channel. I'll post it sometime this week. Who knows, maybe as early as tomorrow. 
Now, this piece of music you're going to hear right now, you can hear on my YouTube channel. It's called Wild Spruce Chase, and you're going to see a time-lapse photography of me writing out the basic components of the score as the music is going by, and then it melts into printed manuscript, so it's kind of easier to follow. So, how do I approach composing? I approach composing from here because the people that are going to listen and consume your music and experience your music are going to be listening to it. They're not going to be looking at your score. They're not going to be looking at the great plugins you used and all that stuff. They're going to be listening to the emotional impact. So, let's go back to the concept of this particular piece. This was a Christmas piece, and I'm picturing a really classy lady. Um, I have my piano here. Um, a really classy lady with pearls and a hat, kind of like, again, kind of like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. If you've ever seen that movie, it captured a particular era in New York. Um, it was kind of glamorous and what have you. So this woman is going from department store to department store, in and out of a taxi cab to, to purchase, make all of her uh, Christmas purchases. So when I start with the piece, I literally start like this, like thinking about it, and things start coming to my mind. And I start going, and then I think of a melody, something a little bit disjointed, something frantic, very frantic, very important here. So I'm going, literally, I mean, this sounds crazy. If you're just tuning in, this is the way I do it. Because great producers have said, if you can't play your melody or theme, if you can't sell your song, just by kind of playing the melody with one finger, you have to go back to the drawing board. So I'm going, so I'm thinking of a cadence like goes, dum ba ta dum ba dum dum ta dum ba do 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 and I need a melody. Okay, I got my introduction there. And I, and I will sing this into the, the memo app that's on my phone, right? So I'll sing those ideas, and it'll sound like gibberish but to, to other people, but to me, it makes absolute perfect sense. So, and then I think, about, I gotta have a melody. How's that melody go? It's gotta jump around, so it'll go. And literally, that's how it happens. So I'll take it from the beginning again, and I'll go. We're going to take the first. This piece goes on for four and a half minutes. I'm not going to sing to you for four and a half minutes. But we're just going to take the first maybe 16 measures. So this is the nerd stuff I came to hear. You got it. <laughs> if you wanted to geek out, this is it. So I made a complete numbskull out of myself by singing like that. So I'm going to switch the camera around. So we talked about you have to have a purpose. You have to have a vision and a mood for your music that you're thinking of. It's got to come from here. It can't come from here. Well, it's, you need this, but you, it's got to come from here. And then you use this to hear it. And then you, all the skills and talents you have of a, being a musician that you've earned over the years come into play. All of a sudden, everything starts to make sense. So I go to the piano. After I've done that thing where I, I have my introduction and I come up with my melody, I go to my piano and I start noodling around. So I come up with, uh, oh, I turn my volume up. Hopefully you guys can hear that. So we got. Right? Oh, that's a good introduction. And then my melody, I continue with my uh, noodling around, and I come up with this melody. And it's like I said, it's a little disjointed. It's kind of almost borderline atonal. And it goes like this.
Okay, so you got that? So I keep working it and working it until I have a basic form of the entire piece, right? We are still at the composition stage. One thing that might slow you down is to try to think of, oh my God, how many tracks am I going to have? Oh my God, what instruments, what samples am I going to use? Forget about, at this stage, you don't even think about that. You want to come up with a great music concept. So I'm going to switch it around. This is a piano score, a piano reduction of what we're going to later work on with orchestration. But right now, this is the composition. So here it goes. Okay, that's as far as we're going to take it. Now I'm listening to this piece in my head, and I'm going to turn down the volume. Uh, to this and speak over it. So now I have the format of the music down. I have the melodies and the themes, the ranges that I want everything to go in. Everything's just working wonderful. Now, the next step, what's the next step? Well, we have to have this played by an orchestra and you just don't magically put a piano piece in front of an orchestra and hope they play all the everything that's in your imagination. You have to actually conceive of, okay, what am I, I have a string section, and even within the string sections, you have contrabass, cello, viola, and violin one and two. And all of those instruments have a very particular role in their own string section if they're playing it in an orchestra. There's sometimes that you know, the, the contrabass and cello may be playing pizzicato, boom, 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 boom. and the, the violins will be playing, maybe a, uh, they'll be bowed, and they'll be playing a legato line, you know, along with the woodwinds. You know, these are all things that you have to envision in your mind. So, again, we go back to this process where I listen to my piano piece, right? And I listen to this piano piece, going back here, with my eyes closed. Right? And what's going through my mind is, okay, I know for this first section, I want the whole orchestra playing, like gangbusters, from the beginning. So I, I think to myself, okay, on uh, the lower parts, there's going to the lower brass are going to be playing like an accompaniment. There's going to be uh, the, there's the French horns that are doing something slightly different, and then there's going to be the trumpets that will be taking kind of a lead line. The French horns may be playing certain punctuations that will support the trumpets. Uh, and, and same thing with my woodwinds. Every once in a while, the woodwinds are like a, a great decoration for an orchestra. There's parts where they'll trill a note, like when you, like, uh, for instance, like this section here. I'm going to go back. Watch this measure six. Okay, we're going to go up at, the, at that last beat. It could be the piccolo that goes... And this all happens here in the mind. Then, then, I take notes. See? I print out what's on the paper, and I'll go into another room, and by this time, I'm so familiar with this piece of music, I don't need to hear it anymore. It's coming out of my head. And I can make notations here. You'll see that I have reeds with muted trumpets. Uh, here I have the French horns. Um... Here there's going to be uh, brass, uh, muted brass and low woodwinds. And uh, with the woodwind section, I also have saxophones. That adds a lot of punch. Um, the saxophone or kind of saxophone section would be a bridge between the woodwinds and the brass. They're kind of like, they can do both things. You know, now in, the, in a symphonic um, orchestra, the saxophone section would probably be either a, a full section would be a bass saxophone, a berry saxophone, a tenor saxophone, an alto saxophone, 
and a soprano saxophone. So you have five voices there. And sometimes the lower uh, saxophones can play along with the trombones and the, uh, <clears throat> the higher saxophones can play with the trumpets and even with the woodwinds and clarinets. There's all sorts of things. They can help add coloration to various parts of the orchestra. We're gonna listen to this basic piano sketch again, just so you familiarize yourself with it, and then we're gonna go into the fun stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna do something crazy. This is the entire ensemble. So, now this project is not magical. This happens over a period of of a week or so. When we deliver the music, we split out all the tracks in stems. In other words, I take, see if you can see this down here, I'll point with my hand. The drums, drums proper, as in a drum kit, is on its own track. The bass is on its own track. Strings, all the strings are all together as a stereo pair. There's the harps and keyboards. Those are all the, all, that's also bells and glockenspiel and vibraphone. There's the brass, it's by itself. And sometimes saxophone is kind of considered part of the brass section, so there's like saxophones in there. There's woodwinds, and that's, that's woodwinds are like bassoons, clarinets, oboes, English horn, flutes, and piccolo. And then up here is our full track. So, and now you'll notice here, I don't know if you can see this, but it says synth. Well, sometimes when I'm hearing this, go to this score here start making notations of what instruments play what and what articulations happen, I'll think to myself, hmm, I want another layer of something interesting that'll give this a little bit more character. Here's the opening of the entire track. This is all the tracks playing together. <laughs> Now there's a funny sound in there. It sounds like a disjointed machine. What I did is I took some of the tracks of the orchestra, I put it through a synthesizer sequencer, which means it takes in the audio and it kind of filters out some frequencies, like maybe high frequencies and accentuates low frequencies, like gives you a window to each beat and you can change the rhythm. There's tons of plugins and synthesizers that have this sequencer option in it. And you can really mess around with the frequencies and the rhythm to come up with something interesting. So I'll go back to here now, just to familiarize ourselves again. <laughs> Okay, now this is the synthesizer track, and it sounds like this. So that becomes a separate kind of rhythm track and it's got a pitch to it so it's almost like it's like a weird clavinet what's really cool about extreme music is that they offer their clients several tracks all the in other words what you see here all these tracks of these different instruments split out and separated that's what that's what they offer to their clients so if they want uh, they say you know what we just like that crazy synth sound we want to use that or if they want to use just the harps we need some dreamy harps. We like the, the music, but we like the harps at this point. And they can re-edit it to uh, fit 
whatever purpose they have. The synth here, I, sometimes I call that magic. And this synthesizer represents probably about at least 16 or 20 tracks of a variety of different things, pretty colorful around this part. You get this layer of magic in the back. So I'll spend a week working on what I call those magic tracks, so they're very important to me. They just add that extra little layer, and you know, if the people that need the music want to take it out, they have that option, or if they want to use the magic all by itself. <laughs> What I'll do is I'll just play this and then I'll, I'll play each section all by itself. Okay, so we're gonna go start from the bottom. We'll just play the drums. Play the drums all by itself. So here's just the drum part. Adam Gomez, the drummer for the Dickies. Here's the bass part. I think I played bass on this. I'm not 100% sure if it was me or sampled. Not very exciting, but I, I think I did play a sample on this. Here's the string section all by itself. Harps and keyboards. See, all those layers add up. It has a little xylophone in there. Okay, then we'll go to the percussion, which is like timpani, orchestral snare. Who knows what that instrument is? It's a castanet. See, all these uh, layers add up. It really helps to listen. If you're going to do this kind of music, it really helps to listen to... Um, and it takes years, trust me, it takes years of listening to scores of classical music, the great masters of the past, and then listening to where it sings in your heart, the music sings in your heart. And then when you look at a score, you go, my God, it all makes sense now. Now I get it. If, you're looking, if you haven't heard a piece of music and you look at the score, you're, you're just not going to discover the magic in it unless you listen to it first. And, and it becomes part of you, it's in your heart. I remember were the symphonies and string quartets of Dmitry Shostakovich. And I got more out of listening to the music than studying the score afterwards than the other way around. Usually in school they'll tell you, here, crack open your book, go to this chapter, we're gonna study this symphony. Here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the Sonata Allegra form, and they'll tell you this is the main theme, this is a secondary theme, and this is the recurrence of the variation of the first thing. And it's like, your, your head's spinning. But if you're listening to the music itself and it becomes part of you, and it's part of your heart, and then you listen to it, then you pick up on it. You will also pick up on orchestration. You'll pick up on phrasing. Very important phrase. All this stuff is, there's just a, a million moving parts. We're listening to percussion.
Here's the brass coming in. I used to play trumpet. Okay, so that's a lot of fun. And so they're doing something different than the strings. They're doing something different than the percussion. And the, everyone's in their own lane doing something that contributes to the whole picture. And that's where it takes a certain amount of experience to, to imagine a piece of music like a composition from the piano stage and then imagine it being played by an orchestra and then making notations. And then in this case, I did a... Uh, a sample uh, version of it before we took it to uh, play by an orchestra because it's always good to, I'd rather make the mistakes here <laughs> than make the mistakes when you have 50 people out in a studio, you're paying for everyone plus the studio time. You don't want to be making mistakes there. When you go to the studio, you want to be performing the music and putting your heart in it, not figuring out, oh, well, this, this, there's too many beats in this bar. You, you don't want to be messing with that. So we do all our homework here, and then when we take it to the uh, studio, everyone can have fun playing this music. Okay, so we heard the brass part, which is like, I'm going to listen to it again because it's just so much fun. Here we go. <laughs> Now, if you listen to the brass, the trumpets are muted. They have a straight mute in it. Sometimes, if there's three trumpet players, the one will play a straight mute, another one will play a a Harmon mute, which is like a, it's like either made out of uh, tin or aluminum, and then someone will play a cut mute. And so the, the combinations together is really unique. Um, so you get that. I don't know if you can hear it at the top. <laughs> And um, and the, the brass the trumpets also play trills with the uh, with the flutes. Okay, here's the woodwinds. Woodwinds is mostly uh, sampled with a couple of real people playing with it. Anyways, it goes like this. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, within the woodwind section, maybe the bassoons or the English horn will play with the French horn. Or the English horn and bassoons might play with the celli and the contrabass. And the clarinets might be playing with the violas. When you know all this stuff, and it takes a while, and if you're patient, it'll come to you. It just will. Persistence will reward you. You can write that down. Persistence will reward you. Uh, getting yourself familiar with music, if you're into music notation and uh, from the classical standpoint, and then you look at the score, you can see where everything, all the things you heard, now you're seeing it notated in manuscript. And then when you do your own music, that will influence you. That's all I'm saying. We're almost done here. I'm going to play you the opening again. <laughs> This is with everyone. This is with the whole orchestra. All that, all those separate elements you heard, I'm now playing it all together for you. gotten everything recorded what do we do we have to mix it well I um, luckily over the years I have made a point to learn how to mix music Let me see. I'm not an expert but I'm very competent I have a very I think and I've gotten compliments from astounding audio engineers that I have a high level of competence now do I have an expertise of course not would I work mix other people's music, uh, maybe. Uh, I will be honest with them. If it's something that, I, hey, I can bring some magic to this, 
um, yes, and if it's otherwise, they'd say you know you got to take it to uh, a real pro. Uh, but I have learned these skills over the years. And when I say the over the years, I can probably be your grandpa. So um, I've learned a lot of old tricks, and I I learn a new trick. Uh, as often as possible. I shouldn't call them tricks, techniques. You know, there are some old um, tried and true techniques that were uh, born from uh, vintage gear from the past that's that's used in the box, so to speak, when we do things in that, inside the computer uh, that work really well. And then there are new techniques you can do because now you have all this flexibility. I think I made a point of the reason why I work in the box is because if something has to be changed, I can have 100% recall and fix whatever it is or change whatever it has to be changed and everyone's happy. Uh, I can tell you that I had some made some really big mistakes in my time and I will uh, I can make that a, make that a subject of the next Monday, Music Monday. All the big mistakes that I've made that you can avoid making. <laughs> so, anyways, so I think we're about uh, closed up here. So, this particular music, I balanced it out, and there's the process of creating the music itself and getting that down in a simple form. Then there's the orchestration of it, there's the production and or uh, recording of it. Then, when it comes back to you, there's the mixing of it. They all have separate mind frames. So when you get in the, the, the production mode of mixing your music, you have to be very, um, uh, very subjective and use what works, balance it out. So the whole thing is a whole, you can't like, it, it's like not every part can be loud. Some people have to be supportive. Some people have to be up front. Some people have to, um, be almost in the back where you feel it, but you don't hear it. So that if you take out that particular track, you know something's missing. And it, it adds that level of subtlety. Sometimes if you focus too much on the subtlety, you're going to cloud uh, the overall concept of the piece that you're working on. So I think that's where we're going to end it today. Let me look at some questions. I'm sorry if I wasn't paying attention to your uh, comments, but I was trying to get this under a half an hour. So we have, with so many unique sounds and layers, how do you ensure what the listener primary focus is? Well, that's a good question. When, you're, uh, when your concept, when you have a firm concept of what you're uh, going for, people listening to your music shouldn't have any questions. They should just be experiencing the music. There's nothing like sitting down and listening to a piece of music that puts you in a mood that, uh, um, that, that means something to you. So if you're working on your music and something is getting in the way of that, you, you have to either reduce it, take it out, or uh, maybe use it for something else. I mean, I've had some really good producers tell me, listen, you know what? Yes, your hook for this piece of music, your hook is, in a, is at a minute and 30 seconds. You should restructure the piece so that part starts up the piece because that's it'll be more effective. And though that's a really good suggestion. I'll listen to it and I'll say, okay, I understand where I was going, but that's actually a pretty good idea. And sometimes you need to bounce your ideas off of other people that you trust that are very uh, uh, qualified, right? There are some people that are not qualified <laughs> to give advice because they just don't want to give advice. So you have to, it takes a while to have a community of friends that you can play music to and they can tell you something honest like that. You know, they, they, they'll say, you know, I'm hearing something in your inner parts that's really working or I'm hearing something in your inner parts that's, conf that's distracting from the main theme, right? So that's what you have to do. You just have to keep your eye on the ball, so to speak. I hope that answered your question. How does the special effects set design a film inspired the music score oh that's that could be another subject for another talk that's uh, because i work with sound designers sometimes we we check notes on what we're doing so we both could we're not walking all over each other and we can do something that works for the scene itself uncle frank productions cool sometimes people call me uncle john um how do you start making music 
Oh, wait a minute. You mean start creating me? I just did it. You'll have to watch the show from the beginning. As a percussionist in high school, I was taught to really listen to the whole ensemble and discover all the nuance and help support them. The, the poetry. Oh, that's perfect. That's absolutely... Th th that concept can be applied to so many aspects of music and music production. Okay. Hello, John. Do you normally conduct your cues and pieces? Well, i got to say, this piece that we're going over right now was conducted by Leos Svarevsky. Uh, he's a conductor in Prague. I like to hear... Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it makes me happy. Thank you. I'm happy that it makes you happy. Uh, Danny Helfman said something similar about learning from listening as he had no experience writing scores originally. Exactly. Because, because the people listening to your music, they're not going to be looking at your score. You know, 99, all of just about the large part of your audience is not going to be looking how wonderful your score looks or how it was conceived or how complicated your retrograde inversions uh, of your theme and melody is. They're, they're, not, they're, they're there to an experience, a musical experience. I had to play castanets in a piece in high school. Well, good for you. Do you have an original tape cassette from Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Yes, I do. I have three of them, and I'm not letting anyone have them. Uh, such an adventure in a tiny segment. Oh, yeah, thanks, uh, Jay. You can, and you can listen to the entire piece. It's on my YouTube channel. It's called Wild Spruce Chase. If you have any suggestions about what you would like me to talk about, I'm going to be doing these maybe once a month or once every three weeks or something like that. I'm going to be starting on a new album that I'm really, really excited about, and I haven't even gone over one note, and I've got a bunch of great instruments from a company called U-Jam. They just have some really awesome uh, plug-in instruments, um, and I just got their um, string library, but it's not like acoustic strings, it's uh, hybrid strings, which are going to be really interesting, so I'm going to be looking in uh, forward to that and uh, check out Adam Gomez he's the drummer for the Dickies he's he plays I believe he plays in other bands beside the Dickies but his first band is the Dickies check follow him on social media he's a great guy and he's a great musician and he helped push this along if you listen to the full track on my YouTube channel you're going to hear how awesome he did. Take care. Uh, uh, thanks for joining me in my humble little creative space. I feel very comfortable here. I have a lot of sunlight. Out my window I can see trees, and it's, uh, it's very quiet in this part of the world that I'm in. And um, I look forward to spending some more time with you. Well, check out my YouTube channel, and you'll hear this piece in its full form. And it's a very interesting visual concept where I do um, stop-motion animation. Not, excuse me, not stop motion, time lapse uh, animation of my uh, writing the score. Anyways, take care, everyone. Mwah. It was great spending time with you. And please stay safe, wear your mask, be healthy, wash your hands. And uh, we're going to get through these crazy times all together and have a lot of fun. There's a lot of great things developing for the future. So hang in there with us. Bye bye, everyone.